Okay, so the next session we'll have is testing, and uh, Sagi and Sandra are the facilitators for this session. Hello. Hello. Okay, so um, we kind of pair volunteered because we didn't want to see this disappear um, from the agenda. Um, so I'm going to start with the question that persisted put in IRC. I don't know if they're on audio or just on IRC. Um, but the question was, and I copied it over, um, I just started looking at migrating some modules to a dedicate, dedicated collection last week. Um, I hear a lot of folks using Molecule for testing collections and wonder what the direction of Ansible test will be going forward and whether the integration testing will look to cover some of the reasons why folks are still using module for module testing. So I don't know if there's anybody here or in Slack that, I mean in IRC, that might be able to answer that question. I can answer for at least the Kubernetes collection. The, the main reason for Molecule was we needed to have the configuration for uh, the type of provisioning that happens. So Molecule is a very generic kind of tool that's built to work with any kind of tool, whether that's Docker or Vagrant or Amazon or whatever. And uh, so we can run a, a cluster through Molecule that gets set up and then we run the tests in it and then it gets torn down. Versus with Ansible test, it's built, uh, at, at least right now, it works just with some Docker containers. I think you can swap out your own Docker container for it. Uh, and there may be a way to kind of hack the cluster into it with a Kubernetes kind cluster, but it also doesn't work with other types of Kubernetes clusters, like using Vagrant or building one in the cloud, which is helpful for a lot of our tests. So that was why the Kubernetes, um, the Kubernetes collection in particular is using Molecule. It also had a lot of a, and I don't know if this has changed at all, but I know that the first time that we were working on the tests, the onboarding experience, if you weren't somebody who is like on the Ansible core maintenance team and already maintained modules and knew everything about Ansible test, the documentation for Ansible test is not and user focused and also at that time was non-existent. I don't know if there is some documentation for it now. Whereas Molecule is kind of like, it's meant to be used by end users. And so there's a lot of documentation. There's examples for tons of things. With Ansible test, it was kind of like, go look at other Ansible test implementations and try to figure it out from there. And also the like internally, I, I had never even heard of Ansible test until November last year. Maybe it was a month or two before that, but I, I didn't even know that was a thing. And it was, uh, for the sanity checks, it's nice and helpful. Uh, but for, the, for the integration level process, it was a lot more frustrating to work with. Okay, sorry about all the barking dogs. <laughs> Okay, um, were there other questions folks had about testing that they wanted to pop in, either in, in blue jeans or over in IRC? <laughs> Felix, the dog collection. is cool. In Go OpenStack ahead. collection, we use actually pure Ansible without and Ansible test for sanity only. We are considering to use Molecule because it has also OpenStack plugin and may be useful. But to be honest, I don't think uh, Ansible test, uh, except of uh, sanity, somehow is applicable for us. So currently, it's mostly a little bit Molecule and just a third module in Ansible. Yeah. So. I can talk, I guess, from the networking side. 
the content team. So I, I would agree that Ansible test is more a test runner. Um, whereas Molecule is a test runner and almost like resource orchestration because you can plug into OpenStack or you can plug into Docker or things like that. Not to say Ansible test will do that, but Ansible test, you need to, you know, you have to go write your own Python code for that. With Molecule, you can just use a playbook. So how we do it in uh, network we can't use Molecule. Well, that's a lie. We have some pretty stringent requirements where we need actual boot physical networking devices. So no containers. So we're kind of unique in that aspect. But it kind of lines up with what was just said about being able to spin up a cluster or you know, being able to spin up some infrastructure, right? So I guess from, from my point of view, it's really about drawing the line what is responsible for managing that infrastructure? And currently, you know, I, I see three approaches. There's the approach of um, using something like a CI system, say Zool, that is just responsible for booting nodes, different types of nodes. And then when the node is online, then the test uses it. You know, Shippable does the same way, but with, dot, with containers and, and VMs. Or you can do something like Molecule, which kind of does best of both worlds, where you can have it do limited uh, resources and then run your tests. Or you can do something like Ansible Test, where you know you mostly have to provide the infrastructure and then run Ansible Test. I don't know which is the right way to do it. It's just that that's kind of the three buckets that I see, having used all three, that it's broken down to right now. So do we, I mean, do we need to develop guidelines on which type should be used? Is it a case of it's really up to the collection owners on what to do? Well, I guess it depends on the type of collection that you have, right? If you have a very simple PHP <clears throat> collection, you probably don't need to orchestrate a lot of different things for it. But if you have Kubernetes and you need to stand up Kubernetes clusters, then that's probably where you want to use a molecule or, or more complex CI system to, to get that state set up. So maybe recommending multiple is the way to go. But I know from a product point, sanity is the thing that needs to be run. And that's how we do it on the networking side. We we almost have multiple ways of testing things, but you know we do a lot of overlap testing to just make sure that we can test the community side and make sure from the product point of view that it conforms to Ansible test because that's what Ansible test is the thing from a certifiable point of view. I, th I think also one thing that gets confused a lot especially if you're talking like Red Hat Ansible platform versus Ansible community versus anything else, is that Ansible test sanity tests module documentation, Python code, things like that, and confirms that it's up to spec. But there's nothing really for roles and also for um, other types of community content that I see mostly on Galaxy. Like the, it doesn't do anything there, and that's also, I think, where the Molecule thing comes in because Molecule is built for roles, so a lot of the people that come more from the side of, I don't maintain modules day to day, like, for instance, me, I, I never had seen Ansible test before because I, you know, besides contributing a small one-line patch here and there to modules, I never really do a whole lot of module development. So I think long-term, if we do want to try to standardize on something, First of all, the uh, the Ansible test sanity is helpful for modules and plugins, but it might not be helpful for roles or other content that are in collections. So that should be kind of explicit. For roles and collections, it's or for roles and, and other types of things, it might be better to use like Ansible Lint and Ansible or and uh, uh, YAML Lint things like that as, as a substitute for sanity. Anyways, uh, I. Because I, I just think that for a lot of people, 
what what are you testing it can be very different like testing a playbook is different than testing a role but only slightly but it's radically different than generic testing of python code but testing a module that's in a playbook which is python code is also slightly different than just testing a playbook because each level you're trying to test a different part of it Yeah, it seems like we need some sort of flowchart or choose your own adventure based on what your collection is about and then some recommendations or potential solutions for what test framework um, to use would be useful. Um, I don't know much about Molecule, I'll be honest, but it's int I didn't realize until quite recently that Kubernetes and I think is it Proxy SQL are using that as part of their CI stuff. Um, we have a thing called the um, collection template repository, which is what we clone fork when creating new repo. So if it's a decent example from Molecule, we could just drop that in there with some with some guidance um, as well as the docs. Maybe that would help. Yeah, I mean. Historically, for myself, the problem that Molecule, the problem that um, that I usually had with Molecule was the benefit that Molecule gave to everybody else, which was the orchestration of the testing nodes themselves. So, in, in the case of Network, we have a really strong platform that will boot us up, you know, VMs or appliances or things like that, or containers or even Kubernetes clusters and stuff. But so in Molecule, if you disable that and use a lot of the other cool functionality that it has to bring a, you know, run testing of a playbook and things like that, Ansible Test has that today with its integration point. You know, you just set up your inventory file with the IP address and the, the, the user that you SSH into and, and away you go. So there's, there is overlap on Ansible test integration or Ansible test network integration. As long as you're able to provide the inventory file uh, with the endpoints that you want to SSH into. But as soon as you say you need a Kubernetes cluster, then um, that's where I see the benefit to Molecule. The other thing that Molecule does give is a lot more pluggability of pretty much every layer. So you can have <clears throat> an Ansible test, it's like it runs a list of tasks, basically, if you're doing an integration test. You, you give it a task file and you can include other task files, that kind of thing. But Molecule can run Ansible playbooks and it can you can have a verify playbook that, that does different verification steps. You can have a lint step that runs whatever linting you want. And you can also integrate it with like uh, uh, Py, whatever the P Python test kitchen or something like that. So some people like it for those things. I, I do like having basically you have like molecule lint, molecule test, and molecule converge. And the other thing that it's nice for is when I'm when I want to pick up a, a collection and start developing on it with molecule, I can just run molecule converge. And on my local machine, that'll bring up an environment, it'll install everything in it, and then I can start developing, changing things. Ansible test, I, I think there might be a way, there might be a command line flag or something now that like leaves the environment running instead of tearing it down. But it's not really built to be that development tool as well. So I find myself, for some of, some of the projects I work on, I still throw a molecule configuration in just because it's faster than me trying to bring up an environment. And I should preface this all by saying I, I'm 99.9% .9 all Linux-based stuff that I do. So networking is probably a lot different, and uh, Windows may be different in terms of, you know, with Linux, I can always just throw a Docker container in or use VirtualBox or something, and it's all easy and, and quick to pop up an environment anywhere. Was there anything else we wanted to cover on Molecule versus Ansible test? So, so just an update from sort of the Ansible side. Long, it, it is on like the Ansible business or whatever roadmap to do some more stuff with her. Um, 
However, COVID has sort of put a pause on some of the recruitment stuff that we're doing, but I, I really hope that we can get some extra people um, on payroll to, to help with this stuff. But this this feedback is really useful, so I'll make sure this is fed into the, the right place. It, it feels like a lot of it is a documentation issue. I've not heard that much yet about lack of functionality. Um, so if there's anything on the lack of functionality side, I'd be interested on, on hearing that, and then we can see maybe if there's some ways of improving that or getting that put on some roadmaps. So a question I had, and, and I think Gundalo, you put this in the as an action item already, is I guess there's another player in all of this is the GitHub Actions. Does anybody want to wax philosophic on when to use that versus the other things that we've been talking about and shippable? I'll say quickly that uh, GitHub Actions has it's it's an it's a system where again coming from the end user's perspective versus somebody who's maintaining a like a supported collection or internal Red Hat stuff. Uh, GitHub Actions has a lot of uptake, it's kind of like Travis CI used to and Circle CI and Drone and things like that. That it's really easy to use and it's integrated with any GitHub repo, any open source repo gets free minutes every month, and so we're using that for the uh, Kubernetes collection, and it has a lot of nice functionality built into it. I personally haven't worked much with Shippable. I just see the reports that come out of it sometimes. In Ansible Podman collections, I use GitHub Actions only, and I don't think I can use even Shippable there. From my experience in Ansible, uh, core is Shippable. It GitHub Actions have a lot of free resources, actually, and uh, VMs, unfortunately, only. Uh, but still, you can uh, run containers there and environments. Also, it's not really user-friendly and has his own uh, very weird uh, DSL, well, Microsoft, but uh, still can be usable sometimes. Also, I noticed that a lot of uh, the supported collections were using Zool. Are they also using Shippable or just Zool? No, most of it is Zool, 100% Zool. So there's still a few like AWS that are doing split uh, with Shippable. But um, for networking, and I know VMware, it's um, it's moved to Zool, and and like I said, most of that is because we're doing like true multi-node testing, uh, spinning up like three nodes for VMware or four nodes, and running tests across you know like in a small network. Um, for network appliances, unfortunately, we can't just we can't like that's the problem. GitHub Actions are great, but as soon as you need to run something a little bit different than what they give you, or you want to do more complex things, it, it tends to get problematic from my experience. But, um, but yeah. The other thing that we use Zool for is we use it, like there's much more to testing that it does too. Like we get true cross-project integration. Like we can, um, we can open a pull request in VMware and have it depend on the Kubernetes collection or something like that. And at test time, we pull in all of those PRs and test them. And then we use Zool to actually gate the, the, the repos so that Zool is the one that's doing the merges, not humans. So more complex because you know there's more complex things that, that it's doing. And then to respond to the DSL language that GitHub gives you, and I promise this isn't me trying to promote Zool, is everything in Zool is Ansible. Like I know it's called Zool, but it's really Ansible. So you, all your jobs are Ansible playbooks and you use roles and, and eventually collections, so yeah. I think I mentioned one time when I was telling someone about uh, the way GitHub Actions is set up, it's like 
70% of Ansible playbook syntax, but with some weird decisions like they use on on as one of the keys and some YAML enters barf on that because on can also mean one or true. So it's, it's kind of funny because it, it feels like you're writing an Ansible playbook, but with a CRAN. So, um, oh, sorry, go ahead, George. George, are you trying to speak? Carol, can you mute George if you're plugged into Blue Jeans? Yeah, I just did. I think he probably accidentally unmuted himself. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so just to cover what I think I just heard, um, that GitHub Actions comes as part of a part of GitHub, and I think what Gundalo is saying in IRC is that shippable is when you say shippable is free for public repos. Is that for public repos associated with Ansible or public repos under Ansible dash collections? All, all public repos. So if you want to use Shippable to test against AWS or Mac Stadium or Windows, because I think we run that on AWS, um, then that incurs a, a financial cost to Ansible. And at the moment, we've limited that to the Ansible and the Ansible collection repos. Okay, so if I was a if I was looking to split something out of Community General and I was looking for my testing options that wasn't going to cost me anything, um, Molecule is an option, Ansible Test obviously, GitHub Actions, and, and Shippable is an option. Depending on what you're doing, yeah. So just to so there's a dependency. Oh, it's, 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 there's there's sort of two parts to this. There's what commands you're running, so that might be Ansible test, Molecule, uh, I don't know, YAML in, Tox. So they're the commands you're running. And then for all of those, they could be running one or more of the scheduler, which could be Zool, GitHub Actions, Shippable, Travis, uh, what else, Circle CI. So they're two separate, two separate choices you can make. So I don't think Zool is specific for any repo. I mean, there's a cost to it, but I mean, there needs to be a discussion if we, I don't know who, hold on a second here. Sorry, my kids are wrestling. Um, but there is a physical cost involved to, to running that capacity. And I just don't know who makes that call aside from saying, open the door and let everybody use it. I mean, one of the things that I think is nice about things that are not Zool necessarily is a there's a huge amount of crosstalk with other open source communities and projects that use things like GitHub Actions or Travis, things like that. It doesn't seem like that's really happened. I don't like I'm not a Zool advocate, and I uh, I'm not, but I'm also not like a detractor. I'm just saying, as somebody who's outside of this whole thing, it doesn't seem like it's used many places outside of the Ansible world. And so not only does that mean that there's not as many like, uh, how do I do this in Zool? And you find a blog post that has this obscure thing that you're trying to do, but also like the interface and the, the design paradigm and, and all that, that was something that turned me off the first time I was like, oh, I could try this out. I was like, oh, where I could spend a day trying to try this out versus with GitHub Actions and Travis and Drone and CircleCI and things like that. Usually it's like, three or four minutes and you already have a job running. It might fail, but you could get it running. It wasn't like that when I was trying to get Zool up and running. And I like with the Ansible one, right now there's coordination required that was a little bit of a, it just adds delay and, and stuff that you don't get with the other systems. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, usually there are communities using Zool, like, um, 
at one point the Aster, Aster's project was, OpenStack does. Um, but it's usually by the time you get to that, you have like significant, significantly more complex problems than the, the other ones provide. So I, I can understand what you're saying because it is a much more complex system. You know, everything that you're talking about from a testing point of view can totally be done on shippable Travis, Molecule, you know, that Zool does all of that. But it's as soon as you start saying you want to do cross project testing, you know. So let's say for argument's sake, we wanted all of the community collections to be tested together at the same point in time at merge time, you know. That's very difficult to do because you have to write all that logic to to pull things in and and pull PRs that are not merged. I mean, you get all that for free with Zool. It's it's a much more complex process to to understand how it works. But at a single module point of view, you don't you usually don't worry about that because your collection is self-contained. Like I said, for networking, we want to ensure that a change to the Cisco iOS collection isn't going to break the net you know, the Cisco NXOS collection, and we do that at, at runtime during testing. Um, but I would agree, it, it is a much more complex system for, for much more complex things. And I guess, you know, in the case of VMware, right, they need nodes to run VMware on, and, and you can't do that on shippable, or you can't do that on GitHub Actions right now. I would say the real benefit to doing something like that, like it's the same thing as standardizing on any platform, you know, say you standardized on Shippable or say you standardized on Zool or whatever, you know, you can start collaborating more and sharing of jobs. I mean, Zool has this idea of, of you know, all of our jobs are, are definitions in Git and they're shareable to not only to any project within the Ansible Zool, but to another Zool outside of Ansible. So like we run jobs from the OpenStack Zool um, in the Ansible Zool and we don't have to maintain those jobs, you know, it's all distributed and stuff like that. But it gets very complicated if you want to make changes or, or go to look for it. So. Okay, we've got, I think, maybe 10 minutes left if I'm looking at the clock right. Um, yep. So far what I'm hearing is there's a there's a a need for some clarifying documentation in areas, maybe something added to the um, GitHub collection template that's out there. Uh, were there other things regarding testing, unit testing, roadblocks, et cetera, that people wanted to discuss? Yeah, I would like to raise up a topic about unit testing. Uh, till now, we talked about integration tests on this, so I wonder if. Uh, I don't know. I was Googling a lot for unit testing for Ansible modules and asked in Ansible Devil and was given a few examples how we do uh, unit testing for uh, modules. But to be honest, uh, I don't have a strong opinion on any of examples or so. And uh, I just wonder if uh, can be a, maybe a different project like we have uh, I don't know, molecule for integration testing, something for uh, unit testing, some framework maybe. Like we like we have like there, class there could for, be. Uh, uh, yeah, and maybe it will be like when, under umbrella of Ansible and the goal is all Ansible changes and help. There, there, there are a few things tied up in that question. Um, First and foremost is probably that most modules are not written so that unit testing is that easy to to do. And that's just, that's a problem with the modules themselves. They could be written differently. Uh, unit testing is really, really great when you have a lot of functions in the, in the you know, the, the strict computer science sense where you give it arguments and you get a value back. And so then you can, you know, you can use your unit test to decide which values to pass in that are important for exercising all the features of the function, and then checking that the value you get back is what you expect. Modules are not written that way. Um, I guess part of it is that they are inherently trying to manipulate the system and make it do, you know, 
here I run on this system and I want to edit these three files and restart this server and you know they're they're operating by side effect uh, but there's other problems too like a lot of modules are written and they they subclass ansible module and then they say oh well you know I'm an I'm an ansible module I'm a I'm a module right so I'm going to subclass this thing and then I'm going to add all of my methods into here and then it gets hard to uh, to unit test that because uh, you have to kind of lie to Ansible module and tell it, hey, you are actually, uh, you know, uh, running within this unit test framework, so we're going to pretend that these are your R and your that and the other thing. Um, so that's that's kind of the the first thing and probably one of the main reasons that people end up using integration tests instead of unit tests. But we do have maybe two frameworks right now in the Ansible core, Ansible base um, unit test directory for kind of faking out Ansible module and telling it, hey, you're you're going to, when you set up, here's your arguments and, uh, and you know, kind of setting up the environment around it so that it doesn't know that it's actually running in a unit test. So those could be pulled out I don't think that we currently have a good way to to just you know push those into into collections other than copy and paste. Um, maybe we could have that pulled out into its own Python package on PyPI, and then you could require that. That that might work, but you'd want to you'd want to take a look there. None of them are that great and I wrote one of them and uh, you know I, I used this and that from PyTest and tried it and it didn't work and then this other thing and oh now it works okay but it's kind of hacky if someone knew PyTest really well I bet they could do a better job than I did um, so that's the second thing and then the third thing would be you can kind of cheat so I was talking about unit tests being really good for you know uh, test one function you pass in data and you get data out and, you, and then you kind of control the data going in and you check the data going out. You can also run it as like an integration test, but you're just driving the module and nothing else. Uh, so you can use, you know, a, a unit test with PyTest and you can just tell it to um, the, the module in a sub process, passing it in the values that, that you want it to have. Or the parameters, uh, and that should be a lot quicker than running the traditional Ansible integration tests, because those, you know, they have to run um, Ansible playbook. It has to parse the playbook. It has to look at the inventory, consult environment variable, blah blah blah. It has to do a lot of stuff. And if you just drive the module as if it was a script from a from a you know the unit test framework, but actually it's an integration test because you're testing this this large chunk of, of code, the, the module, the whole module, you can do it that way. And that would probably be, you know, a lot quicker and therefore more easier to run a lot of tests at one time. End of file. Yeah, thanks. It was useful, especially when you for testing it uh, to, pro to provide some uh, cloud for uh, testing one module. If in instead of that, you can just run unit tests. It will be much useful. Would catch bugs m sooner they than they go into CI. Okay. I mean, we've got a lot of. Uh, I feel like a lot of the actions were document this, document that, which is great. Um, last like. Two or three minutes. Was there anything else people wanted to bring up before the next session? Um, I'm not hearing much else, so I don't know if we want to just switch to the next session or take a two or three minute break. Yeah, let's take a short break and we'll be back for the next section in probably two, two or three minutes. Okay, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Time.
All right, that was a short break, but uh, it's been a long day, so I think uh, everybody probably uh, want to get on with the last session, and um, we will wrap it up quite soon after this. So the last section is on Ansible Galaxy and its relationship to Automation Hub, and it will be facilitated by Jeff Geerling. Hello. Yeah, so, I mean, from my perspective, one of the things that I uh, am always concerned about is the fact that I have like 100 roles on the current Galaxy. And uh, there's an issue I'm putting into uh, to IRC. I opened up a question because there's, so here's what I see, and I'm, I might be a little out of date in my knowledge of it. Uh, but the the idea was, or it might still be, Galaxy right now <clears throat> is in a code base that, that runs galaxy.ansible.com. That is in GitHub slash Ansible slash Galaxy. And then there was a Galaxy Next Gen, which is under Ansible slash Galaxy underscore NG. And that's where I open this issue. The Galaxy Next Gen, I believe, was or is intended to replace the code base that runs galaxy.ansible.com. And I think that Galaxy Next Gen is what's running Automation Hub, which is part of the Ansible Automation platform, and it's kind of like the supported Galaxy. And when I tried looking at it locally, I was like, oh, there's there's nowhere I can put a role in here. And we have lots of roles on Galaxy, like tens of thousands of them versus a few hundred collections. So what's going to happen to all those? And that's why I asked this particular issue. So I asked about that, and then at, some discussion happened here and in IRC and elsewhere and all over the place. And it seems like the, the long-term goal is to make sure that roles don't just disappear from Galaxy. So that was a good thing because a lot of people download roles and will be downloading roles for the next year or two at least, probably much longer, since all their playbooks, a lot of people's playbooks are built with roles. Uh, but then the, the next step is figuring out a transition plan for how do we go from roles in Galaxy to collections. And specifically for myself, I was trying to figure out like how how can I make it so that I can switch to using collections at some point, but also not break anybody that uses any roles that I've ever supported on Galaxy. So, so for to that effect, I also have an issue open on the current Galaxy. It's basically asking like how is it possible for me to convert a role to a collection, but also not break that for anybody who's using the role currently? And um, those are a couple of my main concerns with where Galaxy is today and where it will be going and all that kind of stuff. There's some other things too that I've I've run into trying to figure out how best to maintain roles in particular on Galaxy. Uh, but I, I know some of the other things that I've been tracking is how are we going to get documentation for both modules and roles on Galaxy? Because I think the short term is that the Ansible distribution will have documentation that's built from the modules that are in the collections that are in it. But if I create my own collection that's not in Ansible, the next version, the documentation, I would have to generate my own documentation somehow. And uh, it, that, that's just, it's a little annoying, but a funny thing that I noticed was that maybe a year ago or so when Mazer was still around, Mazer would upload the artifact to Galaxy and Mazer uploaded collections would have documentation in line for each of the modules. And so I was like, well, where did that come from? Apparently that was like a feature that was added, but never removed, but wasn't added to the latest kind of version of collections. Anyways, those are some of the things that I've been thinking about, and it'd be interesting to hear what other people are dealing with and might uh, might know about uh, where things are moving. Um, I think we do not have anyone from Galaxy or or product management for Galaxy today at the summit, so um, unfortunately, I think we what we can do is to capture all these questions, which we will, and uh, hopefully be able to provide uh, uh, some some kind of answer through in, in, in a later time, but um, 
unless there's somebody who, who knows more than I do, please <laughs> speak up. But at, at least for now, we don't have anyone. You know, but please, Felix, yeah. You know, Felix just posted in IRC that he's interested in the migration question because he has a role on Galaxy that needs to require certain collections, but you can't require collections from roles. I believe there's an open issue for that somewhere in the Ansible, or it, I, don't, I think that's in the Ansible repo. But basically you can't require a role from a collection and vice versa, you can't require a collection from a role. So if you, and also up until Ansible 2.10, so in Ansible 2.9, you actually have to run two install commands if you have roles and collections that are associated with the playbook. So that'll be fixed in 2.10, but until then, like Tower itself has to also install twice from Galaxy. And it, in the, on the back end, it's still doing two different installation routines, but it, it's all unified at least if you do Ansible Galaxy install now. Yeah, I think one, one of the... Oh, yeah, go ahead, Felix. Yeah, it was also my understanding that you cannot install collection dependency with roles and the only way to work around is, is convert the role into a collection but then you need some well you have to migrate it somehow and I is there actually documentation on this process like how to, I mean I have no idea how to include roles into collections I only know about plugins and modules so on the other end I also didn't really start searching yet I think that the collection there was a migration guide and it might be in Devel's docs or something like that, but there was a migration. Yeah, there, there's something, there's something I'm trying to look it up in the background. I'll post it in um, IRC and Blue Jeeps when I find it. Yeah, and it, uh, I don't, SSH Nidem, uh said, isn't it just putting the role in roles? Typically, yeah, in a collection, you just throw the role into the roles direct directory and most things work, but there are many little differences, like if your role has anything in a library folder, that has to be moved into the collection itself. Uh, the role dependencies don't do anything, so in the role's meta information, you need to delete dependencies because that won't do anything at all. Um, I think there were a couple other little caveats, but there, yeah, migrating roles to roles and collections on Galaxy. But the biggest concern I had was I have a role named Gearling Guy PHP. And I want to have a collection named Gearling Guy PHP so that I don't have to have like a Gearling Guy PHP collection collection or something like that because that's just making people type lots of extra characters for no good reason. But I can't, there's no way to migrate that or to delete my role without also causing a lot of grief from all the people that use the role currently. So there's no way to transition from the old world to the new world really. And so I'm, I've been pretty much on pause for any of the roles that I have to migrate them to collections for now. I guess I will have exactly the same problem because I also don't want to change the name just because it's our collection. There's also some other thing too. I think if you call modules in a role, they don't work the same. I think that that wasn't related to anything on Galaxy though, but that was something else that was surprising to me. Um, if you use the collections keyword in a playbook, so like for the transitional period, if I want to use the Kubernetes collection in one of my playbooks and I have some tasks that use the, the Kates module, just K8S, and I want to move those into a role, the role also has to declare that it uses the collection and the playbook level collections aren't inherited. But um, th that's one other thing where if you're building roles in the new world order and you haven't yet uh, updated all the module references to use the FQCN, then that can also be a sticky point. Assuming that they're using modules that are from a collection and not just raw modules in Ansible core. That's actually a change which I understand. And I, I think it's also a good change because it otherwise it's, I mean, collections or would, which role um, or the behavior of the role would depend on which collection keyword you would be using in the playbook, which would be would lead to very surprising side effects. Uh, but yeah, I can also understand that it's pretty annoying if you 
well, don't want to update thousands of roles. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for me, it's just one role, like that's my, fine. My but... two, <laughs> yeah, my two concerns are first, like make the process make sense as it is. And I think that the way it is does make sense that way. But also for all the people who do maintain dozens or hundreds of roles, how can we make it more painless for them moving to Ansible 2.10 and later? Have you tried Civil's script? He had a script which reads a YAML file and adds FQCNs and writes it back using RuYAML, so uh, the comments should be preserved. Not all the spacing is preserved, but worked pretty well for the things I tested it on. But it's not, I mean, it, it's not really an official script. It's it's just a gist. And, but yeah. Yeah, something, might, even if it's not official, sometimes it'd be nice to maybe have a list of like, here are some community scripts that can help you in this process mm -hmm. in the documentation. I keep forgetting where exactly it's hosted. Um, it, well, well <laughs> I guess git, gist.github.com slash civil. But I have no idea. I mean, it should be somewhere there, but I also don't know if it's like up to date or needs some update or yeah. I tried it a couple of months ago, I think. So. Yeah, I don't see it just looking at the glancing at this list, but it, it looks like he has a lot of gists. Mm -hmm. That's one, one other interesting point Res, Resmo makes uh, is that roles can be deprecated and then deleted collections can only be deprecated. And I think that's because since the artifact of the collection is hosted on Galaxy, the idea is to preserve that art artifact forever so that you can't break someone's playbooks by just deleting your collection like you could with roles. Um, <clears throat> and I think if you deprecate it, it doesn't show up in search results. Actually, in some cases it did until recently. There was a bug that was showing deprecated things. But one thing that I noticed is like, when you search for collections, the defaults for search are not all that helpful. Usually I see like random test collections at the top of the results. And then the collection I'm actually looking for is later down it, uh, later in the listing. But I think that that's, that's one of those issues where it's like, uh, we, you know, it's pro it, I, I glanced at the code that is used for the Postgres searching and it wasn't something where it's like, yeah, I could hop in and figure that out in an afternoon. It was more like, yeah, you have to know a lot about the way Postgres search works. And Django, which I'm not a Django developer, so I kind of gave up on that. I found the GIST, by the way. It was a secret one, so it, I found it in my browser history somewhere. I posted it in IRC. Nice. It hasn't been updated for three months, so it might not work out of the box. I guess it was still looking for routing YAML. Yeah, there. Yeah, it's trying to find the routing YAML file, which doesn't exist anymore. It's called Ansible, um, Ansible built-in runtime YAML. So with that change, it, it probably still works. I've I, mean, I, like, I like the other gist that was just linked to, it doesn't do anything it doesn't do. That's good to know. <laughs> mm. Nobody else wants to say anything. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry that we don't have anyone from the, the Galaxy team or from product management. Um, I didn't notice this got added to the um, agenda and stuff and, and the time zones on the desk of, of other meetings. Um, but yeah, we'll, I'll pass on the recording and, and stuff and we'll um, try and get some updates for you all. But these are good questions. I appreciate people raising their concerns. A bit of a docs question um, related to collections on Galaxy and Automation Hub. Um, 
we have that docs folder that we haven't really defined, haven't really done much of anything with it yet. Um, and a, a big part of that is because the, the platforms don't have support for it, so we haven't really dug into it. But for the collection maintainers here, do you have a vision of what you'd like to see Galaxy and Automation Hub display based on something beyond module docs, for example. I mean, right now it does module docs and it does the README. Was this something that you all had in mind that you thought, well, someday I'll be able to do this with the docs folder and have it display in Galaxy so people can see it when they look at my collection? I can think only about table of contents maybe for a module, but I think I can see it in some of tabs there. Like just list of modules that I have in collections, for example, and links for documentation for each of them, like TOC. Okay, I think that I think that's in Automation Hub today, so I guess the Galaxy future, whatever that future is, that might come in. But I was, I guess my question is, besides modules, do you all, is anybody itching to put more documentation in with their collection that we should be aware of? I mean, at some point, <clears throat> the issue for roles documentation, so in the past it was every role was its own thing in Galaxy. So the roles readme file was kind of its documentation. And there was never any formal formal structure to it. So it was all just every role author for themselves, basically. And uh, there was a proposal from like 2014 or 2015 that was like, how, you know, can we do a structured roles documentation? And in, uh, in Galaxy, and since Automation Hub has no, uh, no role support on its own, there's nothing there for that. But even I think roles and collections don't do they get the readmes rendered? I I don't believe that they do. I haven't looked at Automation Hub in a while, um, but I know that they don't on Galaxy. It just lists the roles that are available. But at some point, it would be nice to be able to have documentation for roles somewhere. Right now, it's basically you have to build it on your own and link to it from a readme. Actually, what I'm doing right now is I. The few collections I have with roles in them are just submodules to the actual roles themselves, and I link to the role from the role collection so that you can see the documentation on the role. Okay, I'll have to poke around Automation Hub. I'm not sure, I'm not sure which collection has a role, but if I can find one, I can find out if they display anything or not. As far as I know, no supported collections have any roles whatsoever. Yet. Okay, that, that that might make my search easy then. It doesn't exist yet. But yeah, but Anshul just said that uh, roles the role readme gets rendered. So that's good. Okay, cool. Thanks. Oh. Well, Nginx apparently has one. I stand corrected. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to see if there was some pent up demand for docs beyond the module stuff and the and the roles that Jeff brought up. Thanks. Anyone else have any thoughts on Galaxy, Automation Hub, that kind of stuff? I think I'm about out of anything to talk about. I just have a question, maybe it's obvious, but uh... Just automation hub is does it duplicate what is in Ansible Galaxy? I mean, all the collections that are in automation hub, it's the same thing exactly like it's in the Ansible Galaxy public one. I guess from my perspective, I think uh, automation hub is a subset of what's on Galaxy. Everything that's on automation hub is on Galaxy, but the Galaxy version, just like with AWX, might be newer and more bleeding edge-ish than what's on Automation Hub because Automation Hub is the supported things that are attached to a life cycle and, and that kind of thing. But I think someone else might be able to answer that even better than I can. But it, I think it, it basically boils down to if you have a playbook that can run in 
in the Ansible automation platform and be fully supported. It also needs to still be able to run outside of the automation platform, but it just won't get supported if you're not installing all the dependencies from Automation Hub itself. Okay. It's been a while since I heard anything official, but at one point in time, there was the thought that uh, Automation Hub could have things which were not on Galaxy. For instance, maybe some company wanted to put their proprietary Ansible modules onto Automation Hub, and those would not be going onto Galaxy. Yeah, and I think when you go down that path, you start, like in, in my mind as somebody who's more on the open source, not just open core side of things, it it makes me less happy about using software that has forever had all of it available, at least the Ansible stuff is always all available to everybody, to having like a open core type of situation or where you have community stuff that's not maintained as well and core stuff that is that you have to pay for. But that would be something that a product manager type person would probably be better talking about and reasoning about. I don't have anything else to think. Maybe we can wrap up the session and actually that's also the end of the summit. Glendalo, would you like to close with some closing words? Thank you, everybody. Um, but yeah, this has been our second purely virtual contributor summit. Um, I, I think it's been a real success. I think we've had a really great mix of people here, um, some new faces, as well as some familiar. Um, there's been a lot of great discussion and different ideas. I've definitely learned a lot. Um, as with most most times, I've ended up with a much longer to-do list, but that's fine because this is all good stuff that needs doing. Um, so, um, start with the important stuff. Um, might take till next week, but you'll get an email with a link to a survey in. Um, the survey is really important to us that you take the time to, to fill that in and give us some honest feedback. Um, if there's anything where you think it went well or you think we can improve it, please do tell us because that's the only way we can improve this stuff. Also, more importantly, um, the survey is how you'll get to your very fancy limited edition um, 2020 Ansible uh, T-shirt, which the only way you get them is if you come here. So for those of you that are on IRC and just jumped in, um, Carl was just showing you the Eventbrite page, so if you could just do just paste that into Blue Jeans, Carol. Um, just make sure that you have registered on there because that's the email list that we'll be sending out the, the survey and swag list to. Um, this session has been recorded, so we'll get it processed and put on uh, YouTube on the Ansible channel. We'll ping an email out once that's been done, and obviously it'll be in the bullhorn, which you now all know about, and we'll subscribe to and help us write some content. Tomorrow and Wednesday, so the next two days, we'll be doing sort of a virtual hackathon in this channel, so in Ansible community. We will not be having blue jeans going during that. Um, we find just with just to confirm, is the uh, documentation hackathon in Ansible Docs rather than Ansible Community? Ah, yes, thank you. That's a really good point. Yeah, the, the Docs um, hackathon will be in Ansible Docs. Um, ah, yes, I see someone's put that in there. Etherpad already. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll just be on IRC. So feel free just to have IRC in the corner of your screen. And if you see something that's interesting, jump up, uh, jump into that. Also, if you've got any PRs or like more technical questions, this is sort of like our open office hours. Um, there'll be a good mix of people from the community, the community team, and from Core and the uh, content team. So they're the teams developing the, the Ansible collections. If you've got any more technical things, you know, 
stick some code in the PR, ask us some questions. We'll try and help out with that. Um, I think if you're if you're new to contributing to Ansible and you want um, to maybe uh, start just doing some small little PRs, we've got a few little things um, that I think would be great there to help with you, like the ignore list is on there. Um, I think in between some of the other stuff that's going on, if it's quiet, I might do some of the PR review day stuff there. Um, which is where we just sort of take each PR in turn, talk about it in IRC, say what we're looking at and put some review comments on. Given the discussions that we had earlier today about trying to um, increase, you know, increase the, sorry, improve the experience for brand new contributors, we'll look at the new contributor PRs first. Um, try and give them some love and uh, yeah, it should be fun. Um, if there's anything else that anyone wants to do there, or it's like got a little group project, or want something to hack on, please just put it in the in the Etherpad and um, put a, a time next to it in UTC time. Um, and you know, hopefully some of the people will join with that. Um, but yeah, once again, thank you very much. Um, I will pass over to Carol. I believe she had a items as well but yeah for my behalf thank you very much i hope you found this was really useful um feel free to ping me directly on irc at any point if you want to or my email is gundalo at redhat.com but thank you everyone over to you carl thanks gundalo um just one last thing um Ansible fest is also virtual this year and instead of being in san diego it'll be virtual so anywhere in the world you can join. Um, although I have to, uh, I think the, the time zone will probably be a West Coast, a US time zone. So take note of that. It will be October 13th and 14th. And as we usually do, we will have the next contributor summit um, in parallel uh, with Ansible Fast, and it will be on October 12th, the Monday of that week. So um, I'll send out more information about that when we have, you know, the fix the date and the time and everything. Um, there is the uh, CFP for Ansible Fest still go ongoing. If you click on, if you go to ansible.com slash Ansible Fest and click on uh, some of your talk, you'll see the couple of proposals here. July 15th is the last day to submit the proposal. So um, it's, in, it's in one week's time. Yeah, next Wednesday. So um, just keep that in mind if you're interested to submit a talk for that. And I think that's all. Yeah, like um, Dandalo mentioned, if you register at Eventbrite, um, we'll, we will be able to send out uh, the survey link to all of you who are registered. And uh, that's also how we can contact you and give you some links to special swag, swag goodies and stuff. So. Please do that. You can still register in, in today, tomorrow, and probably Wednesday, I think I, I put it to then. So I think that's all I have. Um, anything, Gandalo? Greg? Let's see. I think you might have logged off already. No, that's all, all for me. Thank you again to, to everyone. Um, I guess we'll just put some of the closing comments in the RC log so they'll and then we'll close it up shortly. But uh, yeah, really appreciate everyone taking a good chunk out of their day to join us. I know um, that life is difficult for everyone at the moment. That you know, lots of people working from home, you know, looking after family, trying to do all that basic stuff. And so, you know, spending some time here is really appreciated. I think it again shows how amazing the community is. So yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone. Take care.